So how are you all doing? <coughs> doing well? Great. So I do have a doctorate from Menla Mountain Institute. Or it was because I was teaching with Dr. Bob Thurman and Dr. Mark Epstein, and I felt a little intimidated. I did graduate from college, but I didn't actually ever get close to having a doctorate. And truth be told, my four years of college included two years of independent study when I was in India. So, uh, so knowing I felt a little bit bad, Bob bestowed an honorary doctorate upon me of um, loving kindness. So I was saying this morning that um, the word in Pali, the language of the original Buddhist text is metta, M-E-T-T-A, and the common translation is loving kindness. Uh, Bob, for one, as a scholar, as a translator, has uh, often said, just say love. You know, you don't have to be so kind of cutesy and say loving kindness, which is such an odd, Turn the phrase. They picked up. Yeah, do you want to? The missionaries were saying, you know, love, 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 and then they were <coughs> shooting them and enslaving them. So they, they said, love and kindness. They had to be kind. <laughs> kind of self protective. Yeah, well, that's a good thing. Um, and I've often, as I said, you know, had uh, mixed feelings about the term loving kindness just because it sounds so archaic or kind of religious, and, and of course it is used in other traditions as well, but uh, love has been such a complicated term to, to utilize. Um, and then I was up against it, all of a sudden I'm writing a book called Real Love, and so everybody I encounter is gonna say to me, what's real love? So I don't know if I'm ready to answer that in a brief way, but a lot of what I was working on and a lot of what um, I think feeds my thinking about all of this is actually a line from a movie. Uh, the movie is some years old now. It's Dan in real life. And my goddaughter had a, a itty bitty little part in it and she was, she's just gone to college and she was really like a child in the movie, which is how I can date it. Um, <coughs> She doesn't even really have any speaking lines, but she barks in the movie <laughs> because there's a talent show with all the kids and that's her entry into the talent show is barking. Um, <clears throat> but the line uh, was very profound for me and one of the characters says, love is not a feeling, it's an ability. So love is not a feeling, it's an ability. So I began thinking of love as an ability, a capacity. I ran into some trouble with one of my editors for this book because she said, you can't say that. Of course that love is a feeling. We all think of love as a feeling. We know love is a feeling. And we yearn for love as a feeling. So I sort of equivocated. I said, well, of course we think of love as a feeling. But let's think about love as an ability. And it was very interesting when I, I turned in the book, as I said, July 31st a year late and seven hours early. And uh, the main um, critique or editorial comment I got <clears throat> was uh, the book didn't really finish. I th thought, of course, it finished. Um, <clears throat> finished with the story that I was ending it with, but uh, in the uh, view of that editor, it, I guess it sort of trailed off and it needed a more of a conclusion and you know they suggested a sort of um, review and that I really uh, I had a lot of sarcastic hours with myself with and my computer staring at the screen and making fun of uh, how badly I would have done that if that's how I were ending, ending the book like We've been on a journey together. <laughs> this is how the journey began, remember? Chapter one? And then this is where the journey went. And then, I mean, I obviously couldn't do that, and I was just tormenting myself uh, in that process. And then um, I just couldn't do it. I mean, 
in my mind it ended. That's why I turned it in. Uh, hello, sweetie. And then um, the election happened in the U.S., and I ended the book. <laughs> and it's all based on that concept of love is an ability. If love is an ability, if it's a potential, then is it also a responsibility? Is it something we can work with and look at in any situation? So that's, that's like the ending of the book. And throughout the book, I keep coming back to that, and that's really what I think is so fascinating about looking at something like loving kindness practice. <laughs> the dog is so cute. Um, you know, in that light, because uh, I talk about somewhere, and I began my practice, you know, as I think I said, in January of 1971, where I uh, was doing a, a mindfulness or insight meditation retreat in India. And while loving kindness as a quality is very much embedded in the process of deepening mindfulness, it is actually a distinct method of exploration in meditation practice. And, um, but we didn't get to learn it there. You know, we were doing another technique, and we were doing a little bit of metta or loving kindness practice right at the end. It was almost a ceremonial way of saying goodbye, you know, to end the retreat. And, um, and yet I knew, I, you know, I began to learn that there was a, a way of practicing that really tremendously emphasized the development of loving kindness, and along with qualities like concentration and so on. So um, I didn't really have the chance to practice that in a, an immersive way with guidance until 1985 when I went to Burma for three months and did a retreat just using that technique. So um, I had an experience in Burma, so it's 1985 compared to beginning in 1971, so some years later. I had this experience, which was a very profound experience, and I think it's, like many profound experiences, sometimes hard to find the words for. As I write about it or I talk about it, I think often, I think, that doesn't sound like much, you know? It's my big epiphany, <laughs> you know, for three months of practice in Burma. Uh, but it was a real major turning point, and that was something like, it was also centered around the same insight, it was something around the feeling like some recognition that I had considered love really in the hands of another to deliver unto me. It was a little bit like a UPS package. And if the UPS delivery person was standing on my front doorstep and changed their mind and went somewhere else, I would have no love. I would be somehow bereft or, or deficient or deprived, rather than thinking love is an ability. And someone else, another place, another person, another situation or experience might enhance it and enliven it and enrich it or threaten it or, or whatever. But in the end, it's not a package in someone else's hands. It's within me as a capacity. That doesn't mean fully flowering all the time or, or completely realized or or whatever, but as a capacity, as a potential always within me. So that, of course, was hugely empowering. And that, I think, is the seed that um, really ran throughout uh, my efforts to describe all these different phases and aspects and, and so on of, of a life of, of love and what that might look like in different situations. So love is a capacity. Love is an ability. And that's really the basis of something like loving-kindness meditation practice. Um, if we think of it as something we have to construct or create or fabricate, it's annoying. You know, you're in some situation, you think, oh, really? It's here too. Or you think about it as something that is hypocritical or phony or, you know, it's extremely distressing. I mean, who wants to go there? Uh, my first book, which I just passed a pile of, uh, was called Loving Kindness. And I have a friend who used to read it. He told me he was reading it on the New York City subway. 
And he was so embarrassed to be seen reading a book called Loving Kindness that he used to hide the cover so no one could see what he was reading. And I thought, oh my God, it's like pornography or something. You know, like, but I understand that. You know, it sounds so like yicky. And your mic lost right your mic. It did. Maybe the battery's gone? I think the battery's probably gone. Justin, what minute? Oh, for a second, I'll finish. We got thwarted. Oh, yeah. it's back. Yeah. 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 No, it's back. No. Mercury's in retrograde on top of everything else. Yes. <laughs> well, it's flashing, so maybe just, I think I'll call that one to get Justin. It's working. Oh, yeah, no, battery is empty. Is it coming? Yeah, now you're back on. Now I want, but we feel it's temporary. <laughs> no, that's okay, because Justin's on his way in. It's working. Oh, he's not here. Well, now they can hear me right now. No, no. Yeah, it, 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 it went off. It went off again. It died. We're so temporary. It died. So you can take Bob's. It's impermanent. Justin, my oh, batteries no. are. Uh, it was completely. I feel like direct. a robot. My batteries. Okay. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, you work. So sorry. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> See, we can roll with the punches. Um, so, uh, when we have sort of a, a feeling like a uh, exploration even of qualities like loving kindness or compassion are somehow it's somehow coercive and that it's like maybe having some very uh, conflicted difficult painful feelings about someone or something but kind of covering that over with a thin little veneer of something that's phony and of course it's awful uh, nobody wants to go there but if we understand that it's something potentially very, very different than that and very, uh, very much about aligning ourselves with the reality of things, that maybe things, qualities we've been taught maybe all our lives are strong and powerful or when we really look at them, maybe they're kind of brittle and, and closing and imprisoning and they're not that strong actually. And maybe qualities we've been taught are a little bit foolish, like you're too, you'll be too gullible, people will take advantage of you, you, you won't be able to, you know, you'll lose all intensity, you'll lose all, all fierceness, like compassion. You know, compassion will make you stupid, or generosity will make you stupid. Maybe we take a look at that and we realize, ooh, that's not true, actually. <coughs> There's an amazing kind of strength in those qualities. And it's not because we're trying to convince ourselves, but it's because we're directly looking and this is what we see. Maybe we've been taught, you know, we're really alone, we're really cut off, we're, uh, that's the nature of things. <clears throat> and we take a look and we see, wow, that's not actually quite so, that we actually do live in an interdependent universe. That what happens over there doesn't just like stay over there, you know, it, ripples out over here, and what I do, and what I care about, it actually matters, because it too ripples out. We live, like it or not, in a world that, that is connected. I think about this time, pretty recently, I, I sort of ruined somebody's life when, uh, or so she told me, uh, I was teaching, co-teaching this like six-day program somewhere, and at the beginning, the first night, when I had the microphone, I just, I, I refer to the phrase, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and how many of us, you know, have that kind of ethic and um, value, and we're taught that, and uh, we feel so tight, and what an odd phrase it is, 
it's a dog eat dog world. And this young woman came up and took the microphone and she said, oh, my whole life, I thought the phrase was, it's a doggy dog world, like puppies, you know, <laughs> frolicking and, you know, I never knew there was a phrase, what a horrible thing. So six days went by and then the last day she, she got the microphone as we were closing and she said, I've decided I refuse to live in a dog eat dog world. I'm going to live in a doggy dog world. <laughs> you know, so from conventional understanding, we would often think, well, that makes you stupid, right? And way too vulnerable and foolish. But really, what is our experience? You know, so the power of these kinds of practices is that they're always aiming toward being more realistic, seeing more clearly what is true. And it's on the basis of that that we, um, that we carry them forth, right? That we explore. The other thing I want to say, maybe we'll, we'll sit a little bit soon, um, uh, is that when we do a practice like loving kindness meditation, uh, two things actually. One is, it's really, it's what I call a stretch. Many of you have done a whole bunch of yoga or qigong already today. Um, it's what I call a stretch in that the way they work is often first the acknowledgement that we're in some kind of rut of awareness or attention. We have a, an accustomed, familiar way of paying attention to ourselves or someone else or to the world. And we're just going to see what it's like to pay attention from a different angle or to do things a little differently, to stretch. And this doesn't mean going from a true place to a false place. It means going from a true place to another true place that may get very little airtime usually. So this is the exercise of love as an ability, as a capacity. It's exploring the dimensions of that. So what might that look like? One example is if you're the kind of person who at the end of the day, you look back at yourself through the day almost to kind of evaluate yourself, like, how did I do today? And let's just say you're the kind of person who pretty much only remembers the things you did wrong and the mistakes you made, and why didn't you bring a bigger flashlight, and, you know, um, let's just say. The stretch would be almost like asking yourself, anything else happened today? Like any good within me? It's not pretending and it's not insisting, you know, I did everything perfectly. I'm just like a completely perfect person. It's not like that. But that sort of limitation, that ready, immediate response that is so habitual. What happens if we recognize that but go beyond that and look from another angle? Because it's not the only reality of our morning, right? or a day. Or if we think about how many people we encounter in this world where we don't actually pay much attention to them. We sort of look through them rather than at them. They intimidate us or they're strangers or we don't care about them or they're different, whatever it might be. So we end up objectifying them in some major way. So the stretch is the question, like what happens when we take the time to look at them rather than through them? Many of you no doubt, if you've heard me recently, have heard me talk about um, this really, really cute animation that this company, Happify.com, made, which is also on my website which I think is just one of the cutest things ever. Um, because they had me go into a studio, a recording studio, and just tell some stories. And, uh, and they took two of them, and they made animations out of them. So in the one, I'm about to tell you one of the stories, um, every character in the animation is a dog. So speaking of a dog, eat dog world. Um, so you see this dog's mouth moving and my voice is coming out. You know, it's just like the cutest thing. 
Uh, so this is the story. I was I live in Massachusetts, but I've long had sublet apartments in New York City when I can. And um, two sublets ago, uh, I was living in a certain neighborhood, and I have a writer friend who was also living in that neighborhood, and he showed me a copy of his manuscript that he was working on. In the manuscript, he talked about very, very often going into the neighborhood grocery store, the corner grocery store, and pretty much seeing the same woman working behind the counter. And he said he realized he had virtually no sense of her at all. Maybe a vague, vague, vague sense that she was like a little bit unhappy or maybe slightly sullen or something like that, but really vague. And he was really shocked at how much he had objectified her and not sort of taken her in. The way he wrote it was, for all I recognize, she was a living, breathing human being who wants to be happy just as I do. She might as well have been a cash register with arms. And he was so shocked at seeing that, that he, he decided, okay, I'm gonna go into the store and I'm just gonna pay complete, full attention to her. So he did that, he went in there, and he said the first thing he noticed as he was writing this, he said, the first thing I noticed was that she was singing along to something playing on the radio and that she had an exquisitely beautiful voice. So I said to her, wow, you have such a beautiful voice. And she lit up and she gave me a big, radiant, beautiful smile. So I was reading that and I was thinking, wow, I go into that same store all the time too. And I see the same woman. I also don't really pay any attention to her, pretty much, except for this vague, vague, vague sense that maybe she isn't all that happy. So I thought, okay, here's what I'll do. I can't really go into the store and say, I read you have a really beautiful voice. It's like, completely weird, right? But I could go in and say, I heard you have a really beautiful voice, because that's the kind of thing that might have come up in conversation. So I'm going to go into the store, and I'm going to say, I heard you have a really beautiful voice, and I'm going to see her fairly unhappy, somewhat sullen face, just like light up. And I'm going to make her so happy. So I walk into the store, and the first thing I noticed was she was already smiling. She looked perfectly happy. I thought, oh, right, you know. <laughs> and I realized, like, I didn't have a clue about her. That maybe once I'd seen her, and she looked slightly unhappy, and I just froze that in my mind, and I stopped paying attention to her after that. And so everything really rests on how we pay attention. <laughs> And that's the exercise, is moving, shifting, experimenting with how we, we pay attention. That's really the, the meditative process of loving kindness. And then uh, I would like us to sit together a little bit, so I'm just gonna say, and then just say it, and then we'll, we'll talk about it in the coming times we have together. Um, to develop a heart of love does not designate or determine a certain kind of action. This is another great fear that people have, that were I to get more compassionate, for example, I could only say yes. I could only give you all my money. I could only let you move into the apartment. I could only let you stay in the apartment. Um, but it's not about a particular action, which is brought about by a lot of other factors, discernment, you know, skill, context. Um, it's really about motivation or intention, which is a very good topic for our time here together. You know, it's not what we'll do, it's more like why we do things, why we say things, why we hold back. And so it's taught that if we, for example, have commonly been motivated by fear or a sense of disconnection in what we do and what we say, and we develop a practice or deepen the quality of loving kindness or real love, one could say, um, we will find we're coming more and more from a place of connection, of caring, of generosity of the spirit that becomes very natural because our whole worldview has shifted. And so uh, for all that kind of anxiety that people get, and they get it a lot, um, this is going to make my life, you know, I'm going to be a doormat. I'm just going to have to give in all the time. It's not really like that at all. 
Okay, so why don't we sit together a little bit, and then I'll turn things over to Dr. Bob. Um, and I want to go back, actually, to the practice we were doing of just sitting and being with the breath, because there's a lot of sneaky loving kindness in there, in that, not in a formal sense of, of how we'll do the practice, you know, starting uh, tomorrow, but... You know, how do we speak to ourselves when we find that I haven't really been with the breath, I've been in India. You know, or I've written a treatise on why it's better to sit with your eyes open or closed. Or I've, you know, gone through the list of every one of my relatives and told them about the joys of concentration. Or whatever it might be. How are we with ourselves? If you sit and you settle your attention on the feeling of the breath, and again, in this system, it's just the normal, natural breath, however it's appearing. How do you speak to yourself when you fall asleep, you know, or when you emerge? And it has been quite some time since you last felt a breath. And if you find that a very harsh, kind of punitive voice, you can just recognize that, see if you can soften it, and begin again. Remember, you're going to have to begin again a million times anyway. That's just the nature of things. It's not your fault. It's not like a deficit. And the more we can do that gently and with some kindness toward ourselves, the more kind of effective or efficient the practice is. That's how to actually make progress. Because otherwise, more commonly, sit, you feel a few breaths, you're off and running, you realize that, and then there's usually a diatribe, I can't believe I'm thinking. No one else in the room is thinking. They're all sitting here, they're sitting here in bliss. They're probably enlightened, or they're on the very, very, very verge of enlightenment, like one breath they could go over. You know, they're sitting here bathed in brilliant white light, or I forget the color of the light. There's some kind of light people get, but I don't have any light. All I have is thinking. They're not thinking, I'm thinking, and they're so wonderful, I'm so stupid. Maybe they are thinking, but they're thinking brilliant thoughts. They're thinking beautiful spiritual thoughts. I'm the only one who's thinking about, what panther kill me, for God's sake, you know? Like, what a name is that, you know? And like, could I rename the rebels on my rebel? Just like, oh, I'm so stupid, I'm horrible, right? So when we do that, not only have we extended the period of distraction, sometimes considerably, but it's so demoralizing, it's so tiring. It's not an easy way to learn something or get better, more skillful at something. It actually is easier when we can be more gentle and have that sense of resiliency. And, okay, I'm starting over, I'm starting over. It's natural to get distracted. It's inevitable to get distracted. Everybody gets distracted. Let's not add to it. Let's see if we can let go and begin again. Okay, so see if you can sit comfortably. Close your eyes or not. If you like, you can start by listening to sound and when you feel ready, let your attention rest on the feeling of the breath, just the natural rhythm of the in and out breath as you experience it. When you find your attention has wandered or you fall asleep or whatever, truly don't worry about it. Right in that moment, See if you can inject like the spirit of loving kindness and let go and begin again.
And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes. Dr. Bob. Tibetan psychology and I. They're not totally sure you're the amplifier? No. Oh, I have not moved up, that's fine. <coughs> I muted in your honor. Thank you. Okay, cool. So, uh, fits with a bit of Tibetan psychology, although it's not either or, I think, as I'm sure you, you did that. Uh, we can see it. And, uh, love is, um, Maitri in Sanskrit, metta in Pali. And um, Maitri comes actually from Mitra, which means friend. And so it's that, that emotion that binds friends together. And also, they, they, they deny that, but I think it also comes from Matra, of course, which means mother, which is mothers are very friendly with their <coughs> offspring, at least for a while. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's sort of the biological model of altruistic love is the mother is motherhood, and um, fatherhood a little bit running behind, as that uh, communion said during the election. Remember how huh? um, even the even the do nothing mother would provide two hundred percent, and the best dad could only come up with forty percent. Remember he said when he was going to vote for Hillary, you know. Said he wanted a mom in the office. But uh, Louis C.K., I think, yeah, yeah. a very, very funny thing, unfortunately. Anyway, I won't get into that. But uh, it's defined as uh, the wish for the happiness of the beloved. So it really is the agape form, not the eros form. In the Greek, two, in the Christian, two divisions of love. That's the agape form. And um, no possessiveness, no desire associated with it in the in um, you know Abhidharma and uh, in the in the Tibetan psychology coming from Nalanda and um, the great pundits of Nalanda and um, the piece about the love and compassion in the Buddhist thing that 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 doesn't get uh, looked at so much often by the scientists the neuroscientists and people I bet you do touch on that I'm sure in your book but the piece that they don't look at that much is the root of love and compassion as a cultivable ability, uh, which is um, wisdom. And then I'm the boring person who always brings up the wisdom, wisdom issue, knowing something, which involves learning something. And, uh, but unfortunately, as Shantideva says, you know, the great teacher of compassion, of the precept of compassion in his guide to the Bodhisattva way of life, Everything the Buddha ever taught was all for the sake of wisdom, because all the only thing that liberates you from suffering from samsara is wisdom, you know, which is a kind of knowledge. It's not maybe the ordinary dualistic knowing the numbers of something or knowing the name of something. It's knowing the reality of something, which may be a different kind of knowledge, more deep, non-dual, where you kind of become the known. The knower and the known boundary dissolves ultimately, and so you you know by being one with what you're trying to know, with that reality, in other words. In the case of transcendent wisdom, and um, so compassion grows from that. The true, what they call the, the true love and compassion grows from that. Now, now of course everybody has love and compassion, and this is something I think. Also, in the Buddhist, including Theravada psychology, Mahayana, Tibetan, Indian Mahayana, or Tibetan Mahayana, which is that, you know, inf immeasurable love and compassion are two states, contemplative states, the four immeasurable states. The first two are love and compassion. And somehow I think people too much think of that when they think of that sort of um, stratification of the meditative states. They think, therefore, it's a place you go. It's, it's like a heavenly realm where you go, where then there's a measurable love. 
and you find that miserable love because you went somewhere. But actually, of course, it's something in yourself. And through a certain type of meditative expertise of the immeasurables, you come to a place in yourself where you just feel love toward everything. And everyone looks lovable, and you want them all to be happy, and you just are a great wave of wishing for them to be happy, as it is there. But that's in you. And so when you achieve it as a meditative state, it just means you go back into yourself and you find these immeasurable places in your heart, you know, in mind, where you are, you feel, you know, connected in a positive, loving way to all beings. And then the next step, compassionately, you, by, by reaching out and connecting with them, you note that they're not, that, that they are not that happy. You know, by wishing them to be happy, but in a connected way, you note that you sort of run into the obstacle of themselves, stubbornly, being there, unhappy. And then that's called compassion, where you can't bear their unhappiness. And then somehow you reach a place in yourself of joy, I don't know how, that you really have to go crazy, I think, <laughs> to get to the immeasurable joy. Because you think that they're resisting you and insisting on keeping their happiness. My ultimate image of that, keeping their unhappiness, is an existential philosopher on the left bank with his cool wild cigarette and his glass of cognac. <laughs> so like, I'm keeping my happiness. Je ma souffrance. Oh, il me faut ma souffrance. No, no. Je ne pas prendre ma souffrance de moi, ça fait. Et cetera, et cetera. I guess it's somehow my image is that. I guess I met a few of them in my in my youth. And uh, I'm sorry to break into a wrong language. And uh, and then you reach that you become a quantum mouse. You even go beyond joy to equanimity. You know, and those are the four states. And we always talk about beyond, beyond, and they are presented as heavenly places also. And one can go to them actually. One can. In that, finding that place in oneself and thinking that that's such a great place, I don't want to go back to the human plane, then the ordinary human plane, the samsara plane, then one is reborn as a deity of those realms, of what they call Brahma body deity, Brahma Kayaka Deva, uh, they say. Um, so that's that. But, 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 but um, on the human plane, on the other hand, on the Bodhisattva plane, there's just an interesting piece I think you, you might find helpful where they say there are three types of universal compassion, uh, you know, in a sense of real compassion. And I think real love and love and compassion are just totally connected because love wants the beloved to be happy. Compassion can't bear the beloved not being happy. So they're kind of like a, two sides of a coin, the two, the two things. And the 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 sentiments of that type, the thinking, the thoughts, I wish they were happy, and I wish they didn't suffer, are not considered genuine universal compassion or love, or real love and real compassion, because although they have the mode of it, and in that sense they are good, but, but if combined with the ordinary ignorance of perceiving things as sort of being stuck in the intrinsic realities they seem to possess, perceived by the person who perceives everything as having some sort of intrinsic objectivity, fixed objectivity. They have no strengths. They, they cannot become an ability. They just sort of perceive something, and then they just they have pity for that something, the compassion part. The, the love part sort of wants them not to be suffering, wants them to be happy. but doesn't have any, doesn't emerge as an ability, doesn't move anything. So the first one that moves something is said to be combined with the wisdom of impermanence. And I think this is, I know this from the great Indian pundit Chandrakirti. He's the one who, sort of the locus classicus in the Nalanda literature at Nalanda University, Great British University in North India, from the Actually, it's said to be on the property belonging to Shariputra's household. So it really must, some seed of it went way back. It's usually said to have been really gain, gaining strength in the 4th and 5th century 
and running until the 12th century. Uh, it's the great, you know, greatest university in the world, actually, at the time, it was said. And um, so I know it from that time, but it's, earlier it's there in the Abhidharma, I'm sure. You know, I can't think of the specific quote, but it's there. And why does impermanence then release a beginning of real love in that context and real compassion? Because impermanence is the awareness of everything is changing. It's the, it's the knowledge that things are always changing. And, there, and in a way, it, therefore, it's about oneself is always changing and objects are always changing. And it's a, it's a perception that erodes the sense of things being stuck as just what they seem to be. It's that first level of wisdom where one sees through the facade of what they call in the intrinsic reality habit about things, that they're just what they seem to be. And, um, and therefore, the wish for the happiness of the person, the love for that person, loving kindness for the person, or for the object of the loving kindness, it could be animal, it could be their person too, actually, uh, is something that seems to have a bearing. It can connect to them because it, they can change into being happy. So it sort of becomes, it starts to move out, becomes an active energy. And uh, then the compassion also their suffering or their state of suffering, their sickness, also can change. You know, it will pass and they will come back to, and, and therefore the wish to, not to bear their suffering, therefore the wish to erase their suffering, to take away their suffering, to dispel it, to cure it, to heal it, seems to be a moving thing also, the, you know, the energy. And then the joy energy comes stronger and the equanimity energy comes stronger. So that's the first level, is the level of the knowledge of impermanence. Uh, where, where love and compassion become un universal, become powerful, become, move toward ability. And I, have to, I want to, there is a Buddhist concept about the ability thing, to reinforce what, you, what your thesis, but let me just finish this. Second form is where it combines with the wisdom of personal selflessness. It's technically <laughs> referred to personal selflessness. And that's where uh, one realizes through looking for a fixed self in oneself, like a fixed identity in oneself, one somehow fails to find anything. One looks there, you know, introspectively, using mindfulness and ultimately samadhi, one-pointedness, and sort of drills inside, going through the five aggregates, you know, body and mind, different layers of subtlety of mind, coarseness and subtlety of mind, and of course the body itself, and uh, doesn't find a fixed identity, like a, identity meaning something that always is the same. That's the Bob Thurman in here, you know, type of thing. The Sharon Salzberg in there, the, whatever your name is, in there. And you, when you fail to find that, and you, t and you can tolerate the failure to find that, and you, that tolerance extends deeper and becomes an awareness and um, a feeling of freedom from being imprisoned by some fixed identity, which you didn't realize before you have that quest that you were imprisoned in having some fixed role or identity, subliminally even, in your mind, even if you didn't have a theory of a fixed identity. And that's the realization of personal selflessness. And when you realize that in yourself, in a way it's a deepening of the impermanence because you then realize that others when you realize that, it doesn't mean that you don't you somehow have a disappearing experience and you feel that you don't exist at all or something like that. That's not what it means. What it means is you begin to realize yourself as a process. You fail to find yourself as a fixed thing that is in a way outside of process or aloof from or alienated from process. You don't find any such thing in your process. And then you become aware by, the, by sustaining that failure that you are a process. And the minute you have that experience, which the Zen people always have something very helpful, which is they say it's an experience as if your face fell off. <laughs> and actually it's quite an apt statement in the sense that personality, you know, person, persona means a mask in Latin, I believe. And so it's like the mask of your fixed self fell off. Because, but that's what the Zen people call it, but actually it's where you can't find something that's completely fixed in yourself, you, when you really try deeply, and you keep failing, 
and then you don't be, you overcome the fear of that, and you tell, you 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 process that, and then you begin to come alive as a process, actually, rather than you liberate it, in other words, from having to sort of defend a fixed entity that's you. And when you do that, then you, you perceive others as a process. So it's a deeper thing of seeing the changeability of the others. So then the energy wants, then the energy of the real love wants to be the ability that helps them go in that direction automatically. Naturally, it flows that way. And then uh, the compassion automatically wants to help guide their process to where they can free themselves from suffering. And uh, since you can't bear their suffering, you, you adopt their own suffering of their suffering in a way. And uh, uh, a different way than the way they're stuck in it, though, because at that point you see them, see it, it as a process, and you realize there's an imbalance in the process, and you're not trapped in it. Uh, but you don't ignore it either, so you want it. So your compassion is, becomes the ability of helping them alleviate it. And then the final uh, level, the highest level, the Buddha level, the high Bodhisattva level of, of, of real love and compassion is when. Is called, um, oh yeah, and the, and the first one, when you have the knowledge of impermanence, it says that when you have the wisdom of impermanence, the first level, it says that's the compassion, universal compassion or great compassion that perceives beings. And in the second level, when you have personal selflessness, it says the great compassion that perceives processes or things, phenomena or processes, I think it's best. And then the third one is called the great compassion and the great love, real love and real compassion that ha does not perceive anything. That, has, that is, in that sense, kind of unconditional and, in other words, non-objectifying. In other words, it, it, that's when you realize what's called objective selflessness. You realize the selflessness of the process itself. In other words, you realize that even a phenomenon or process doesn't have any kind of intrinsic objectivity about it. And then that, in a way, is where you feel completely one with the other, the beloved being, the be compassionated being, and therefore you automatically, you know, want happiness for yourself as the other person. So there's no division between you and the other person in some way. And you also automatically can't bear them to suffer. So you automatically, your ability is, is in a way, it's even, it's their ability magnified by your ability, so it's more powerful than their own own ability, you could say. And that's, it's a, you know, that's where we, language will fail us a little bit. It becomes a little bit inconceivable. But, it, but it's a really good one, you know. Too, too often in uh, mysticism, People think uh, there's a mystical experience of oneness, uh, but and in that mystical experience of oneness, there's nobody present, <laughs> which is where they're tolerating not being able to find themselves a little too much, and they so, and therefore not being able to find any other person in another person's process, and they're not even be able to find a process in the process. So then, so people assume you're sort of floating in the sky, or you are the sky, or something. And you and they are not there, and yet you somehow love them and, hate and don't want them to suffer. <laughs> that doesn't fit, you know. That's a kind of, that's where you haven't gone beyond the failure. You, you sort of grasped onto the failure as if there is nothing there. You know? <coughs> Rather than let the failure to find an intrinsically real or intrinsically objective person or, or process, that failure to find reveals the fact that there is only, there is a relative person in process. Everything is filled with relative persons and process. So that freedom is filled with, with relativity, in other words. And all the other beings are there, and yet you are one with all of them. And then that's when it becomes a little bit inconceivable. Now, the thing about the ability is so neat. What I love about your theory, you didn't tell me about your theory, but what I love about it is that, you know, the Bodhisattva, you know, is the one who... You know, the Bodhisattva is, the Bodhisattva is not an angel who flies in the sky, although there are Bodhisattvas who do that, celestial Bodhisattvas, sort of. But a Bodhisattva could be human, but it's just a human who has made a, who's converted their process of life into being there for all beings, and wanting to become a Buddha 
to think who has the ultimate ability to love really all beings, you know, selflessly and altruistically, because there's no desire for any happiness for themselves out of it. They therefore are surely a sort of sharing engine of happiness for other beings. So that's the ultimate sort of ideal Buddha. And a Bodhisattva is one who sort of recognizes there may be such a condition, and they're definitely going to do that for the sake of all beings. Because they want that ability to expand to where it's very, very effective. As, as maximally effective as it can be, knowing logically ahead of time that there's no omnipotence, so you can't ever make them all happy. <coughs> From fortunately, Buddha. Buddha's good news was that everybody's going to be happy to be a Buddha sooner or later, and I'm a Buddha, and I'm really happy too. But sad thing is, I can't make you happy. You have to make yourself happy. But I can help you learn something that you can make yourself happy with, if you want to learn it, sort of thing. All these come, and, and it starts with don't believe what I say necessarily. <laughs> you have to doubt it and struggle with it and make it your own. See if you can find the flaw. Now where the ability, so in the, in the Bodhisattva path, I'll just briefly explain some Bodhisattva, in that Bodhisattva path, there are these things called, the, people call them the perfections, which I don't like. They're called paramita, it sounds good. And paramita is glossed by all the great um, scientists, Buddhist mind scientists. Uh, it's going beyond, a going beyond. Itta is past participle as the verb e to go. And param means the other shore. So you're going beyond an ocean of suffering, the ocean of samsara. Param itta. And therefore transcendence, I think, is a better word. Although it's a little scary. <clears throat> and uh, um, perfection has that idea of something being sort of finished complete, whereas the going beyond, like the going beyond of generosity is where you become so generous that you don't notice that you're giving anything to anybody and nobody's receiving it, so you don't feel you need a reward or a thank you, you just automatically give everything. And that's called, it's a, it's a double meaning, it's generosity at its transcendent point, and it also transcends the idea that you have generosity, which is so you don't get all self congratulatory in a certain way. So it's really nice, I think. So anyway, these, but, but compassion and love are not in those uh, transcendent virtues. They're not even there. There's generosity, ethicality, or I call it or justice or morality. <coughs> there's patience or tolerance. There's creative effort, you know, effort toward the, the good. There's uh, meditation, concentration, and there's wisdom in this sort of set of six that are very famous. And then there's three, there's four more, seven, eight, nine, ten, in a, a little less famous, but they're there. And one of them is called Upaya, which people horribly translate as skill in means, which I have a big bone to pick with on that one. And then there's um, prayer or vow, power, and um, intuition or intuitive wisdom, intuitive knowledge, meaning direct, immediate knowledge, is the tenth one, the tenth of those. So none of them seem to, there seems to be no real love in there. There's no real compassion in there. In all the Bodhisattva virtues, there isn't any, and it's terrible. But Upaya, if we can escape from the ridiculous translation of skill and means, which comes from the, when you add to the Upaya something called Kaushalya, Upaya Kaushalya, the word skill is a kaushalya, that's fine. And then upaya as means, so upaya just means means, or method. But, and I translate it as art, because art is a means or a method. You know, art doesn't just mean a painting, that's one kind of art. But you have the art of healing, you know, in the faculty of arts and sciences, engineering is an art, and uh, medicine is an art, and uh, whatever, all those things are arts. You know, I mean, it's how you do something. It's the broader meaning of art. So art is an ability. So art is what, when, when love and compassion move you, and, then, and you move toward the processes of other beings, who are the beloveds, you know, and when you do, as you know from, you've all been in love, you've all had relationships, and you know that relating to a beloved requires art. It's an honor, the lady. You go up, you know, oh, I love you, dear. 
That doesn't help. Get lost, the bug. <laughs> you know, and you have to be aware of what the where they are, what they are. You have to be sensitive. You have to like whatever it is. There's an art to relating positively. That's the ability part. It feels where the other, what they need, what they want, what is, what makes them happy, what doesn't make them happy, and and the feeling that you have, of course, the love feeling is happiness. If you don't have happiness yourself, how would you think someone else would need to be happy? If you are miserable, and, and you know, and you've forgotten even or depressed so much that you don't even think there is any such thing as happiness when you're in a mood like that. Oh, so so oh, oh, that was just a delusion I had. There is no <laughs> such thing. So there has to be some. So that therefore, in a way, you know. They say the first person you have to have compassion and love for is yourself. Then you have to have the art of loving yourself. Which means not just being narcissistic, having narcissistic personality disorder like our, like somebody. <laughs> the nameless one. But it means that, so it doesn't mean narcissism, it means <coughs> wanting yourself to be happy, therefore artfully deciding what will make you happy and what will make you unhappy, and sticking to what will make you happy, avoiding addictions, which will make you miserable, although they seem to make you happy, for example, mainly. That's the main thing. So, so, uh, so that's the ability, upaya. It's the art of lo loving as art and as ability. And um, because when, when real love is connected to the beloved, and real compassion going along with it's good, it's just the other side of it. You know, you want them to happy, therefore you can't bear them not to be happy, so you're compassionate. And it's a connection. And then, what is, this, what is the art of that connection? And what is the ability of realizing what your love and compassion wants for the being that you love and are compassionate towards? And what does it want toward yourself? It took me 45 years of studying Buddhism, I think, and trying to practice a bit, a little very lazy bit, but a bit, to realize, for example, that renunciation, you know, and the reason they're all madly in the, in the history of Buddhism, and in Buddha's time, the people meet Buddha like they were running around, they were like, had a job, they had a business, they were princes, they were kings, they were whatever, they had work, they had ambitions, etc. in the world, and they meet the Buddha, oh yeah, I want to be a bhikkhu, I want to be a monk, oh, I want to be a nun, let me out of... Uh, let me out of the house, please. Mom, dad, mate, husband, wife, children. I know you can. Other people can. You can work it out. There. I want to go be a free person. I want to be a monk and a nun. Why? Why are they doing that? Because they 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 dislike themselves. Because they want to deprive themselves. That's what we think, right? We have we have this Protestant attitude in America. Even if we're Catholics, we have this Protestant attitude in America that. You know, people who go to monasteries are a little bit defective. They didn't read Freud. They don't know about the id and the eros and the unconscious, and they're just going to go and sing choirs and sit in the choir. And they go, oh, yes, that's good. They think we think. We don't realize, in a little bit, there is that flavor, right? But we don't realize that those people are the ones who are skillfully loving themselves. You know? You read the early nuns. They <laughs> say, Oh, Buddha, I love you. You're so great. Thank you so much. I just had free lunch. <laughs> Someone else cooked it. They gave it to me. I only have one bowl. I just wipe it out when I finish eating. And I put it in a little sack over here. And I'm cool till tomorrow. And, and uh, if it's not nirvana, it's close enough. <laughs> and uh, you helped me. You liberated me from three crooked things. My rice pounding, you know, they didn't have like blenders, you know. My rice pounding mallet, you know, what do you call it? Pestle, you know, in a mortar and pestle. My, my rotten old pestle I used to have to husk the rice with. My bent over old mother in law scolding me about whatever. And my hunchback husband. <laughs> Thank you, Buddha. I am fine. And uh, I'm under this tree here, and it's a nice day. <laughs> so, you know, the, the renunciation, in other words, I'm not saying anybody should be a monk, and it was, nobody's going to give us a free lunch in America. 
basically. Unfortunately, it's not that generous a society. And uh, so they want to, now actually they're poised to take away everybody's temporary free lunch, those who are unemployed, so a little bit of a food stamp. And uh, so I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying that the act of renunciation, or what they call ninjong, transcendent renunciation, I call it, where you transcend the sort of duties of the human life that fits into the society of being productive and doing your bed and all of that, and you want to move away from that in order to fulfill your own human destiny of being an becoming an enlightened person and finding true happiness and being able to share it with others. And that's your, you know, your education in a way, your spiritual education as your primary thing as a human individual. And uh, therefore, by loving yourself, it means allowing yourself to seek happiness rather than just work. We're in some situation that may or may not produce happiness. And uh, I never kind of, even though I had been a monk and then an ex-monk and this and that, and I never I realized you know, that because we, it's, a, it's couched in a language of deprivation. Whereas, you know, fa and family life is like, there's all these Buddhist things, there's one guy, one monk comes back from his free lunch at some layman's house by a lake. He's going, oh, alas, 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 alas. And they say, well, what's the matter, brother, or whatever his name was. I've met the Mogalana, you know, and might have, I forget. He says, oh, I said, I just had lunch. They fed me over there, and they said, they said and the householder was there, oh, alas, alas, the samsara, the samsara. And they said, well, what, why was it so terrible? What was the matter? And he said, well, um, the host, you know, the, the, the master of the house, was sitting there, and he was eating a fish, because they were fisher, fishermen, the, the cast or whatever. And he himself was eating a fish. I don't know if he fed, he didn't say whether he fed him fish or whether he gave him some vegetables. But they, didn't, they don't specify. You have to take whatever you, can, you get, actually. Buddhists were different from the Jains in that, in that way. But you couldn't let anybody kill something for you. Then you had to decline and leave. But whatever they gave you was already done, you deal, you had to accept it. And uh, he said, he was eating his father, because the father had been a fisherman and was reborn as a fish in the same place, and the guy was eating it. And this guy was clairvoyant this month. And he was beating his mother, and he was like whacking a dog, driving it away from the table, who was the rebirth of his mother. And he was cuddling his enemy, and he had a newborn son who was the rebirth of his worst enemy who was reborn as his son to gain revenge. <laughs> I mean, the clairvoyant saw that. He didn't tell the family, apparently. He might have been, he might have been running for his life if he had. But uh, that's a very typical Buddhist story, right? There's many, many stories like that. And we, we, we don't agree with that, right? We love the family. And I've had many, so many students over the years say, oh, that Siddhartha, he left his wife and baby. What a great boy. He never went back. She was so unhappy, and the Buddha, and the Indians do that too, the Buddha life stories. She gets really mad. She says, that guy, what is he? he did, I want him to go, she said, <laughs> with him to attain a learn. I really said I can meditate. I can meditate better than him, she was saying. How could he heartlessly leave me? And then he's leaving this poor baby here, like with no dad, you know, like what a monster. You know? She gets quite angry. Of course, the grandfather is really upset. It's a shattering thing when he leaves his house, you know, in Indian culture. But later they all became our hats, saints, enlightened, very happy. The country got invaded by the neighbor because there was no one left to fight. <laughs> they were in all such a good mood. They didn't, they didn't mind living or dying. You know, that's a bad, that's a bad byproduct, perhaps we might think. But, but it's really nice. So, okay. So, therefore, real, that's totally backs up. Your real love. So I can read your book very effectively. Oh, I'm Mahayana. so happy. <laughs> Mahayana. <laughs> From Mahayana perspective, because upaya, it's a wonderful word, upaya. You know? Upaya. It can mean also a trick or strategy, stratagem, uh, skill. You know, it, it definitely it means art in the sense of doing something artfully, you know? explaining it in a way people will understand, you know? uh, or, do, or <coughs> giving medicine that will really heal them. You know? It's artful by knowing really what their problem is. 
by feeling, by a sense of oneness with him. I'll never forget um, Bernie Siegel, before he was the famous Bernie Siegel. He wrote a description of seeing Yishi Dunden, who was the Dalai Lama's physician long ago, still alive, but not quite the same anymore, very old. Now, do a grand rounds at Yale and then watch him in a, it's one of those things where you watch from a theater, you know, in a hospital, watch him take the pulse of some patient. And Ber dear Bernie, you know, he was just an intern, you know, or he was a resident or something. And he said, it was like a great giant golden bird. He was holding the wrist of the lady. You know, the way they do, they take the two pulses on the two wrists. And, uh, but not just the timing, they, they have 12, six antennae, six corners of these three fingers on the two hands. So 12 antennae, actually, in total, to the two wrists, into all the organs and several other person. But he said, when he was doing that, and this is a little monk in a red thing, you know, and the lady, I don't know what, where she was sitting or lying down. And he, he said, I suddenly saw, he said, like a giant golden bird enfolded the patient within its wings and completely took it to its breast, you know, and just sort of felt the whole nature of the person, you know. And he was an amazing diagnostician. Mm -hmm. he, done he, he, was. he still is, I'm sure. Amazing. And he would tell people like, Four years ago, you know, in the summertime, you had this and this phenomenon, you'd feel a little faint in the evening, you'd have to, like, stop what you were doing for a few minutes, and the person would have forgotten. They'd say, no way, you know? And then, like, ding, like, three minutes later, they went, oh, yeah, how did you know? I forgot myself. You know, I've, se I've seen that in the many, many things he did. So that's in the medical area, you know? So that's the ability. You know, and that comes from love, and that's why medical school, the one major course you take in medical school is not dissecting corpses, although you could do that in Tibet, they always dissecting them because they feed them to the birds. And by, you know, instead of like giving their organs to science, they give them to the vulture. And uh, so they know about corpses, but um, it is how to cultivate love and compassion for beings. And they say, if you're trying to be a doctor for wealth, status, fame, then you should try to pick another profession, because you'll be a rotten doctor, if those are your motivations. Your motivation has to be compassion for suffering beings, love and compassion for suffering beings. Once you do have that true motivation, you'll be an excellent doctor. You will find the way to help them. You'll have the ability, the real love ability. <laughs> the real love ability you'll find, you'll have. And then, by the way, you will be wealthy, famous, and you'll have high status, because people will really appreciate you, because you'll be able to really help them. But if it's your motive, you'll suck as a doctor. That's right there in the Tibetan medical school, in, in the Buddhist Indian medical text. So there's major course hours in love and compassion, not to mention lots of course hours in nutrition and diet. They discovered kale like centuries ago. <laughs> so, so that's my contribution. Okay, so we have a few minutes, so well, let's meditate. So, so go back to love and compassion meditation. And uh, maybe pick someone who you love and want to be happy and visualize in your mind and then meditate critically whether and then note let's say oh, first note in your, as you as you visualize their their presence from what you remember knowing them and note where they may be not so happy, uh, what, what makes them not happy, when they're not happy, how it looks. And then couple your wish for them to be happy and not to not be happy, your love and compassion, connecting to them, seeing how they're not being unhappy tends to pass, is impermanent. And in a way, note that 
when they seem to be happy because of some external happening that they depend upon to be happy, they immediately become unhappy when it doesn't last. So try to look deeper and see where in them is there some deeper feeling of well-being within them that has to do with them kind of resting in themselves, feeling the kind of presence of their health, their selves, and their, their mere presence or something, which is a kind of deeper contentment than the passing and permanent waves of momentary satisfaction and its loss of discontent. So cycle of content and discontent, a deeper inner contentment. Try to seek that within them, in your mind. Then imagine your ability, your upaya, and your relating. I'm, I imagine you're thinking of someone that you know well, you have a close relationship to of some kind, and then think of how your manifestations can help them artfully touch that place in themselves, where there may be a kind of innate contentment. It's at a sort of deeper plane than the surface pleasure and pain. <coughs> if you're like me, you can think of many unsuccessful approaches <laughs> and that didn't work in your relationship. And you can try to feel what were successful things and what was their quality and how did they interact with the process of the person. In another session, perhaps, we can do something similar with an enemy, a rival, or an irritating person, as well as a close person, and then see how 
love is the best way of disarming such a person and the best way of liberating ourselves from the fear of the person <coughs> kind of see how loving the, loving and compassion means trying to help the enemy find freedom from the suffering of being our enemy I think it's, a, it's and I find the happiness of not having to hold us as an enemy and how can that be approached I think that would be a very fruitful one you know, love your enemies, okay, we'll do that we'll do that tomorrow perhaps cultivate those abilities These Tibetan bells are really great. There's a whole story on it, you know, the art on it. But it is nice. Can we have a few questions? Mm -hmm. Do you want to take some questions? Just saying. Uh, well, it's... Uh, we have a couple of minutes. We have four minutes. Yeah. Well, quick question. Yeah. This is going to bring you a microphone. Oh, Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, um, tell it me seems like, that. Nicole. Of course, you said it yesterday. You were like <laughs> the first question yesterday. Thank you so the, much. Um, yes, Nicole. Thank you. The two different forms of meditation seem so different. Bob, you're telling us to think and really process, and you're telling us not to, I think. Um, <laughs> are they both meditation? Which, which? Well, um, I, I teach and what you teach. Seems oh, well, yes. Because you're telling there are two us kinds to of think. There are two kinds okay in broad think. categories, in, at least in Buddhist psychology, there are two kinds of meditation, which goes for Theravada, Mahayana, whatever. One is called shamatha, which involves trying not to think, not to be distracted by thinking, and focusing one point of the ultimate, right? But at least concentrating on one thing. Uh, it's the general moving in that direction. And then there's what's called vipassana, or vipassana, which means, uh, which involves thinking. Although, uh, and, and mindfulness practice is sort of a mixture, but most meditations are a mixture of both. But they are both kinds of it, those kinds of meditation, yes. And um, vipassana has a connotation of critical thinking. Thinking in such a way that you're editing the thinking and trying to change the current of thinking from negative to positive. It has sort of that thing, and also has at its deeper levels of vipassana. It has, it has the go, the go, the job of critically re seeing through analytically the false perception of things based on ignorance a, and ignorant mental habits, what they call the self habit or the objectivity habit, or they have, they have a very sophisticated way of analyzing all of that and trying to really perceive the reality of things. And vipassana is like cutting away the delusory overlay that we place over things with our conceptuality. But it uses thought to unravel the imprisoning thought, if you will. Vipassana does, and it's in advanced <coughs> stages. And mindfulness is a kind of vipassana, actually, because it's, you know, when you, even when you focus on the breath, you're picking first the breath, you're then, you're catching your mind, wandering away from the thing you set your mind to, and then you're noting the things that come up in your mind, et cetera, et cetera. And she's the master of all that. I won't, I won't summarize it, but that's moving around in your thought stream, with your thought stream, to try to master your thought stream. But it isn't necessarily only aimed at just sh shutting off your thought stream. That could be a use of it. But that's not the sole use of it. So, you, so broad categories, the sort of anti-thought type of meditation, which it may seem to be to some, but the, and the use of thought to go from negative to positive type of meditation, and both are meditations, yeah. Well, and also yours was a visualization. Can you speak to the microphone? Yours was a, I think, um, was a visualization to maybe to create something that we want in our lives. That what, that, that, that we want in our lives. That we want to manifest in our lives? Oh, uh, well, yeah, then you're going, that's going in a kind of magical direction. 
And uh, yes, but that, that's like rehearsing something, yeah. you could say. Yeah. And that's a good thing. You know, I love that guy, that high jumper. I always liked this famous red-headed six-foot-four high jumper who was Olympic guy for a while. He would always stand before he would start his run, and he would go like... <laughs> and, uh, and then he would do his run. And he made seven feet or whatever it was. He, he won some medal. I don't know when he quit or what happened or how great he was, but he's been transcended since then. But you could see he was visualizing himself get over the, the bar, you know. And he found that useful, you know. Maybe, maybe not. Some people might say, well, he's just wasting his time or building his confidence, whatever. But in a way, that's rehearsing, right? So, yes, uh, that is. That is that. Uh, Michael, do you want to... Um, Another question? Uh, I think Michael's here for our announcements. Oh, Michael has some announcements? Yeah. I have one announcement, which is tomorrow morning, I'm doing the morning meditation uh, for Fiora. At 9.30, right? That's at 9.30? 9.30 to 10.30, is that what it is? Yeah. In the new yoga? Okay, so I'm doing, that's just one announcement for today. Uh, we're swapping time zones. Could I make an announcement about it? This is a one-way road. Oh, yes, and Nina would like me to make it, or Nina's making an announcement. Oh, since I have a mic, I'll make an announcement. When you're driving up and down in the car, and we may also be doing that, although we may be grounded by a snowstorm tomorrow, uh, I have to be trudging. But when you do, we try, when there's a group here, a lot of cars, we have a one-way... <coughs> sorry, a one-way circuit. So we, when you get up here out of this parking lot, you go left, and it's a little long way around to come back around to the to Lhasa Inn. But it, you know the road is a little narrow, and if you're bumping into people, so it's better to have a circumambulate in a counterclockwise direction, which is the way that the mother tantras say to do. <laughs> Father tantras go clockwise, but anyway, we won't take it amiss if we go counterclockwise. Okay, so that's the second thing. Thank you, Nina. Yes, Mike. For the record, that was on my list. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we had one other announcement. Carolyn and I wanted to see if we could start the asanas at 2.45, because that's such a long time, from 2.30 to 4.15. If we started at 2.45 and giving people more time in the afternoon. Sure. So, um, can you help me remember to inform the front desk? Yeah. The central station for... Oh, and if you have to repeat that with a microphone. So, uh, the request is to start the yoga, the afternoon yoga class at 